Good evening and welcome to the TNT show. I'm John Drummond and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes and we are going to guarantee you a very exciting 60 minutes. Uh, I want to say at the very beginning though that thanks to you the TNT show and Indie Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows. Oh by the way I can't say anything about this but there's a new show coming up so watch this space. You can watch the TNT show for example on IndieLive.net uh, you can see it streamed out on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. Plus, if you go to YouTube, you'll see all the previous 128 shows. That's right. We've done 128 shows featuring the cream of Scotland's commentators and, and others. And let me just say, if you're upset by the media coverage of political events, uh, you know, and, and Kevin, maybe you could flash up the... The, the, the photograph of the two characters at the uh, First Minister's uh, 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 press conference the other day there, yesterday. Uh, if you're upset by the media coverage of political events where journalism is often junked in favour of stenography and or rehashed news releases, if you're looking for an alternative voice, well, you found it. We're here for you. And now it's your chance to be here for us. Uh, please support the crowdfunder. You'll see the details on the screen. It's terribly, terribly important. Unlike the BBC, we do not have a budget anywhere approaching £300 million a year. Uh, let me just also add that it's been another great day for British democracy. On BBC Radio 4 this morning, Nick Robinson posed this question. Quotes, what does it really matter to us who is the first minister in Scotland? Close quote. Now, I'm not sure who us is in this context, but we'll try and deal with that question and a number of others tonight. Tonight, we'll be asking primarily about what's next for the independence movement following the resignation of Nicola Sturgeon. We'll be putting this question to the star panel of broadcaster Leslie Riddock and CEO of Business for Scotland and Believe in Scotland, economist Gordon McIntyre Kemp. And they will also be taking your questions live. So if you're sitting there confused by recent events, concerned about the future of the independence movement, well, you've come to the right place. And there's still time to get your question considered. You'll see the details on the screen. Now, as you know, TNT stands for the Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Now to our guests tonight, we'll be welcoming Leslie and Gordon. Uh, thank you for joining us both. Uh, how are you? I'm not sure if Leslie is here right now, but if not, let's start with Gordon. Just me to begin with. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Uh, it's great for you to join us at such very short notice, Gordon. We're deeply indebted to you. What are, what are your initial, what's your initial reaction to the resignation yesterday? Well, I think the first uh, was surprise. Um, and then the second was not surprised. Uh, and I think everybody sort of like, you know, we, we, were, we weren't expecting it, but it didn't seem completely off the cards once you'd heard uh, in particular. So, um, yeah, I think that um, I don't think many people know, in fact, knew. In fact, I know because I've spoken to loads of people who were talking to very senior people in the SNP, and you'd be surprised how few people knew. So, um, frankly, uh, it was I was even briefed in the week leading up to it by several people from the SNP that she was definitely staying. So, it, it may well have been sudden. It may well have been something she was just talking to only a few close confidants about. Um, but yeah, first reaction, surprise. Second reaction, well, we've still got to win independence. And what we're going to do is figure out who, or they're going to figure out who their new leader is. And uh, we need to work more closely with them uh, than we ever have done before. We need to set a date. We need to set a target. And we need to get campaigning. We need to get independence support up. And we need to win. And I think we're going to. What makes you think we're going to win? I think it's our time. I think the um, the movement from 2014 is still together, but it's had the wind taken out of its sails uh, by delay after delay, some of which were nobody's fault, some of which were legal, etc. Uh, but also, you know, there have been a few false starts uh, which came from the SNP, uh, but we're there, we've got everything, um, we've got hundreds of groups restarted. Believe in Scotland has, has helped start uh, lots of new groups as well. Uh, we have the ability to put out 
uh, hundreds of thousands of leaflets, in fact, a million newspapers in 2019 in one month. Um, and so basically, I think that the, the, the grassroots Yes campaign is ready to go. We just need the SNP to deliver its end. Why do you think it hasn't delivered up until now? Well, that's, that's a pointed question. I, mean, I think that um, uh, what the, to, to start with, the SNP has delivered independence support. It's delivered uh, a majority government. It's del delivered a second yes majority government in partnership with the Greens. It's given us uh, the first referendum. We would not be here if it was not for the SNP. We've got to give them their place. We've got to really understand that there would be no talk of independence were it not for that organisation. They are the dominant political force in this country. Um, and despite what some of the people in the papers are saying at the moment, that's not going to change anytime soon. Um, but, you know, why haven't they delivered? I think there's been a few mistakes made over the last few years, certainly since 2017. Um, but I think that if we are now get the right leader in place, and I'm not sure who that is, but if we get the right leader in place, the right policies in place, and the right relationships across the whole yes movement, then we can really start pushing things forward, um, raising independence support. And the key to everything, it doesn't matter what people are talking about. You're talking about Westminster or Holyrood or whatever, or joining EFTA or EU and all these policy things and process things we're talking about. The key is for the independence movement to get out on the streets, talking to people, convincing people, talking to them about the benefits of independence, talking about the type of country we want to actually create with the powers of independence. That will move the needle on independence. We can get it up to the high 50s and 60s and low 60s. And at that point, it's a done deal. The writing's on the wall. Yeah. That's what we need to do. And that makes the pressure on the UK government to agree, to negotiate, or to um, uh, agree to an official referendum so much greater. That's where we need to be starting. And I think it can be done. Good point. Good point. Welcome, Leslie. How are you? <clears throat> Fine. Thanks. <laughs> I thought I was going to be on Channel 4 News tonight. And everybody seems to have been in this thing that... Um, I mean, honestly, it's been like a blooming blizzard for the last two days. And uh, I, I can't even remember in the indie ref, um, you know, just so, such a sustained interest suddenly in Scotland. It's extraordinary. We made it for two days. And and yesterday, um, all the, the main uh, kind of UK um, news programmes were actually anchored from Edinburgh, even in the kind of Baltic conditions. And even though there's nobody in the actual parliament, <laughs> um, you know, so... It's extraordinary, actually, the focus there's been on this. I mean, partly because Westminster's in recess, so there's, you know, he who else ex happening apart from Jeremy Corbyn not being allowed to be a, a Labour MP again. Um, so there has been quite, you know, an avalanche of interest, and it's still mm. sort of buttering on. Um, and in the midst of that, it strikes me, having been on God knows how many things, um, that the narrative they're sort of building is um, is to actually big up Nicola. You know, not many of them are stupid enough now to try and, you know, try and go for her. But what they're really sort of saying is, look, this woman was incredible. She was popular. She was, you know, almost like an international mm -hmm. stateswoman. If even she couldn't get independence on the line, over the line, you guys are stuffed. Mm -hmm. So essentially, they've come to praise Nicola and bury independence. It, well, so, what's interesting about that approach is that that's roughly what happened in 2014. But anyway, Alex Salmond was, was the, the man who was going to make it. He failed. And now the whole independence movement is crushed. Yeah. So anyway, honestly, I'm just so whatever. They will do that, you know, so you can spend a lot of time agonising about it. What it strikes me that we need to do is, um, and I, I mean, honestly, I really hesitate to mention this this idea again, but here it is. We need to actually get out there on the streets and have a big march. Yeah, we need to we need to show that independence isn't over. And there's no clever arguments that do it. There's no well formed words. There's no what aboutery of oh look you did that the other time. All of that is irrelevant. What has to happen is uh, that people have to get their sorry asses out onto the road onto the streets of Edinburgh. Um, the, the time for Scotland lot, we had a wee conversation about it because it keeps, we, you know, this seems to be our bag to do these, try and organise these things. And happily, we've got some of the folk in our midst who are very involved in All Under One Banner <clears throat> and know the technical side of being able to stage things very well and have now 
had a, a lot of experience negotiating routes, access and all sorts of things with the council, the parliament, you know, everybody. So that's my thought. I think we need to get right out there and show, because this is the narrative that is half coming along, is that basically independence is stuffed. Uh, it's not going to go anywhere. And the only people who can, you know, gainsay that are people watching right now. And the, the best time to do something is actually before there is a new SNP leader, because that's the moment for the for the movement, because Ooh. there isn't yet an SNP leader when it all will become about them again. So that's well, my tuppence worth. Uh, well, that's very helpful. Uh, 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 moving that along a little bit, we spoke to... Uh, uh, the organizer of the uh, Chain of Freedom uh, 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 project, which is to link hands all the way across central Scotland uh, using the canal system. And she was on, Judith was on last night, telling us about it. And I thought, hey, as you made those remarks, that's something that people could do. She's a health and safety expert, so it's not going to be done in a sort of ramshackle way. Uh, but the whole idea is to join hands, a bit like Estonia, Latvia, and, and Lithuania back there. There's the, there's, the deta there's the details on the screen just now. Uh, and that seems to me something that would be uh, hard to overlook if you've it would got be, it would be hard to over, It's hard to overlook. The question is, we've got to do something quite quickly. I mean, what one thought is to try to actually pick the date that may soon be vacated by the SNP, as in March the 19th. Because if they're not holding a conference that date, then that almost exactly is the narrative that, you know, the SNP can't make this decision. They can't make that date work for them <clears> because <throat> obviously they've got a new leader to, to decide. Oh. But hey, the end of, you know, yesers uh, can kind of essentially fill okay. the void. That gives us one month. So cool. that's one month to organize something. So I'm, I'm in favor. I, I think it's a good idea. Uh, get a big march, get something showy going on. But yeah. it has to go hand in hand with real campaigning as well, because marches are showing our intent, but we need to be delivering leaflets, knocking on doors, holding street stalls, and moving the independence support up in the polls. Um, and it's a combination. We can't, you know, we can't just march or hold hands and hope that's going to make a difference. It's not going to make a difference. Um, and you know, I like the idea of the the the, the hand chain across Scotland. Great that it worked in the Balkans, but you know, there's a time and a place for that, and it's not right now. It's it's to really show. It's when we get independence into those high fifties, then it's probably more practical. And also, it's a it's a victory lap type of thing. It's a really showing your force and how many people support it, etc. Right now, we've got to do some baby steps and actually get the campaign working. And in the last few days, I've had lots of phone calls from people uh, and a couple of meetings with people who are saying, I just don't know if I can go on. And I'm saying, look, you know, this is just, you know, we're not completely, the, the, the SNP is not the whole yes movement. It's yeah. a major part of it. It's the dominant political party, fair enough. But we've got a role to play. And I don't actually think we can really truly win independence, even if it's a, a plebiscite, uh, or a de facto referendum for Westminster, etc. We can't do that unless there is a very strong civic grassroots campaign that isn't connected yeah. to the independence movement, making the case for independence. Because political parties, as we've seen, are hugely tribal, and you know they've. You know, how much more can the SNP do? Can they get us to fifty-five percent? Probably not. They've probably pretty much maxed out their support. So if we're going to convince people who don't like the SNP, it has to be not the SNP that do it, which is why there has to be, it goes hand in glove with a functioning yeah. leading party and lots of good show-off events, but also hard shoe leather wearing down campaigning and talking to people and engaging with people that work on the doorsteps. All has to be done in unison. And, and you, you've got this uh, Congress at the weekend. Yep. Tell us about yep. that. Um, well, basically, the, the, it's called the Scottish Independence Congress. Now, I believe in Scotland uh, has 136 affiliated groups. Uh, I think it's 129 local groups are affiliated. They're all independent, but we work together and we do uh, days of action and coming up with it, several weeks of action, ending up in a day of action, etc. Uh, we've delivered since 2019 about 3 million physical items of campaign material uh, through the grassroots uh, network and also the one million paper 
uh, newspaper uh, initiative that we put together uh, with the SNP and the Greens. And every time we have a, a push, every time we have a day of action, every time when we put that uh, newspaper out, we've seen independent support rise 2 or 3%, uh, even higher than that. Um, and so basically, we're getting together. Uh, we've got 176 people, no, 179 people right now registered to attend the online conference tomorrow. And we're going to talk about how we deliver independence. We're going to talk about uh, what path we need to go down in order to demonstrate the settled will of the Scottish people and what we need to do as independence groups to raise support for independence. Uh, and we're going to, we, well, one of the things was we were absolutely going to uh, make representations to the SNP special conference. But as Leslie said, the word is that they're now going to postpone that. And I think that's a terrible decision. I think that needs to go ahead. I don't think you need to have a leader uh, there. In fact, that was one of the things Nicola said. She said, um, my own personal preferences leader might have swung it. I think it's for the party. And so to say, oh, we're not going to do it now because the leader might want to go in a different direction. That's not the democracy that that party has actually said they want this conference to be all about. I don't think we need any more delays. I think they need to set the direction, fire the starting gun, and then bring a fresh-faced leader in to make it happen. Mm. Well, one of the thanks. One of the comments we've had, Leslie, is that people would like to do the sort of thing that you're talking about and what Gordon's been so eloquently describing, marches, Congress. But what they're saying is Nicola Sturgeon didn't turn up for those. Actually, honestly, whatever. Honest to God. What, mummy didn't come, so you're not going to play? Well, I think it's what larger than that. I, I think they're saying that... Oh, really? What the fuck? I mean, you know, you've got to get to a stage here where you care about this enough to just stop blaming other people, stop who... Do, can, can I say to you that having knocked my pan in with sciatica to organise two bloody events that were in horrible weather conditions just so that Nicola could trot out and say her thing go in again, if anyone was going to get a wee bit previous about Nicola, you're looking at her, right? <laughs> but there's no point doing that. There's no point, oh, you know, she didn't cover it. Forget it. You know, the point is they're not going to have an event on March the 19th, right? So the, the, the issue then is what do we do about it? And I mean, Gordon's exactly. totally right. The stuff that will actually change everyone's minds is the in and about stuff where you're talking to people. However, we're at a moment where, and this is all that Time for Scotland exists to do, is to identify when there's been a challenge to the Scots and then to respond quickly, timiously, and in a way that hits a media agenda, hopefully. And at the moment, this is a big, big challenge to independence because it's being cast in every single interview I've been in and the others I've watched, it's being cast now as a Nicola couldn't manage it. She was a superwoman and none of you have, there's nobody else there going to get independence over the line. And we have to push that back. The only way you can do it is by having people come out and prove they care. Now, mm -hmm. this is also, it's, it's, diff it's a dangerous strategy because it's actually saying, do we care enough to get, to get ourselves organised and get out and do a march? I actually don't know. And that's why I'm raising it tonight, because we've decided there's only a month. We've decided from our We Time for Scotland group that we will make a decision on Monday as to whether to try and do this or not. And then we will once again knock our pans in to try and make it happen. So we need to know whether people are up for this or not, okay. because I think it's a great idea. So we great. don't need the SNP's permission to campaign for independence. That is the thing that everybody seems to think, oh, well, the SNP aren't doing this and aren't doing that. Well, if you really want the SNP to put even more of a focus on independence than they always do, which is, I think, a, a fair ask in some cases, but if you want that to happen, then go out and campaign. Join your local yes group. Take part in fundraising, in leaflet deliveries, in street work, and move independence support up. And that puts pressure on everybody, all the independence parties to work better together. It puts pressure on Westminster, on the unionist politicians. It's about raising the polls, not about waiting for permission from a political party. They've got other fish to fry. They need us to actually do our job. I, I take your point, but can I test you on that, if I may? What happens, maybe if I can ask you this, Leslie, what happens if uh, having expended all that effort uh, and all of that being well received, the polls indicate that support has continued to uh, decrease? 
So then well, you're had, well, I've had, well, I've had a good walkout. I mean, yeah. honestly, what how what do people's brains work like? The only thing worth considering, the only thing, is whether or not we would we would run the risk of 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 essentially calling for independent supporters to show they care, and then no one comes. And I've had to stand there twice waiting to see if that actually happens. So I mean, it, it's that's the calculated yeah. risk, and that is a risk. You know, so that's why I'm asking. Just let's clear all the other snatch away here. The only thing that matters is whether people think that they will turn up to prove that independence is back on the road again. Because, you know, it, that is pretty much the, the most demonstrative, visible way to respond to what has been a seismic political moment. Yeah. Um, but by the way, did you have any warning of the resignation? No. So you would have taken aback as yeah, the rest of I mean, us. Nobody speaks to me from the SNP anyway, so I would be the last to know. <laughs> yeah, well, here's a here's a question that you know you, you may feel uh, this is antediluvian as well, but uh, but there's a number of people very concerned about the uh, the media coverage that Nicola experienced, particularly laterally, and, and some people have described it as abusive. Would you agree with that? Is that me? Yes. Yeah. Um, some of it was. <clears throat> I mean, there's there's a sort of pack frenzy thing that started to happen for sure. Um, pretty much when I can't remember the name of the guy from ITV who just kept going about whether or not that trans prisoner was a man or a woman. I just kept going and going and going, and it was almost the first time that Nicola actually was just caught. She she's such a good performer, and that was you know the minute somebody had sort of as it were breached the wall then it actually became like a bidding war for everybody else to be able to get through. So um, everything intensified from the minute that that answer um, actually happened. Um, I see, you know, I mean, for example, you've got James Cook there. I'm not going into everybody's political proclivities here, but there's a lot of people being um, targeted within the BBC who are not opposed to independence at all. Uh, shall we say, um, for example, I, um, I was interviewed by James Cook about he, a piece he was doing about the Yes movement generally that was going to be put on BBC Network News um, before before the, the March the 19th thing. And he actually phoned me about four hours ago to say, I'm just checking with you that the things that you said in one context, viz, you know, Nicola not having gone, um, I'm planning to <clears throat> use these following clips in what I'm about to do and he just read out exactly verbatim what I'd said and said, is that OK to use? And I said, yeah, it's fine. And honestly, that's what a proper journalist should do. Uh, the one thing I would say about that, that press conference that I did, did find gobsmacking, and it happened every time with COVID conferences and all the rest of them, is that essentially Nicola pours her heart, emotion and effort into communicating all sorts of really delicate and philosophical points mm. and then it's as if she didn't even say any of it and they just yeah. come back in with bruising questions it's almost like being at your own funeral and then being asked to agree that you're crap um and i thought that was just unbelievable that nobody not a single person could kind of had the co courage to reflect back what everybody else was watching thinking which <laughs> was wow isn't that the way the media is going generally it's it's becoming tabloid I mean, if it doesn't bleed, it doesn't lead. It, that's always been the case, but now it seems to be even more grotty. And it's going that. to be it's going to be the same for anybody that becomes leader. They're going to face exactly the same pressure. They're going to have the same questions, the same treatment. So whoever is chosen is going to have to be a, a real uh, media. Uh, sorry, just a uh, quick, quick interjection for me. Do you, do you seriously think a man would have been treated the way she was treated? No, not to the same extent. There is definitely a difference in the way females are treated and the things that are said about them, um, very definitely. Um, uh, and I think you know that that does mean that it is could be more difficult for a female to to hold a role uh, such as first minister of Scotland, where the battle is over something as tribal as the constitution. Um, I don't know what Leslie thinks about that, but you know, frankly, uh, a lot of what I saw did seem to be to be sexist in nature. What do you think, Leslie? Do you think she was treated well, it's, differently there's, there's, because there's, she was a woman? There's, there's swings and roundabouts in it. I mean, 
Um, yes, but then again, I mean, she she has actually got enough of a stature that a lot of the time you could, <clears throat> I I could see um, in a, in a funny kind of way. I think that's what it is: is that she has got such kind of presence and gravitas as a person in a room that a lot of these guys almost get themselves fairly fired up to be able to kind of deal with her. Um, so I, I and the other thing is the net of how somebody comes over is also how they're treated. If somebody really is perceived to have gone over the, the edge, and if you look at those COVID press conferences, the whole uh, way that Jane, uh, Janie Godley managed to take the piss basically out of a lot of them was that the questions were utterly idiotic. You know, they were actually not even listening to the previous guy's answer yeah. a lot of the time. And it was the kind of patient way she went, well, I can for the fifth time, Gordon, say, you know, or whatever. Um, that went into the mix of everyone understanding how she operated and it didn't make you know it didn't make them look smart at all so i don't know over the piece it seems to me the whole thing is extremely bruising and there's no question about it it's a mm -hmm. constant battle and i think this is where the relevance is because it's not just for her it's for everyone in this this thing um, the, the human body is equipped with a fight or flight mechanism when it's under threat and when you're not physically moving away, you mm. can do neither. Yeah. And essentially, Nicola has been stuck not being able to have a proper fight, a square go, an independence referendum, a campaign, yeah. or run away. She's stuck without fight or flight. And actually, that, in the end, that makes you really ill. <laughs> you know, so. yeah, I, yeah, I think I think we've all been there. I think it's uh, if you live any length of time at all. But what people say to me, mainly women, say to me, uh, you know, I was fully behind independence. Why did we go off at a tangent to talk about gender? Why do you think that was? I, I honestly don't think that's even worth worrying about now, to be, to be honest. You I think know it's a dead duck. It. You think that whole thing no, is going there? I don't think it's a dead duck. But, I mean, you know, within the things that I've done, I mean, like I was on with Alan Cochran on, what was it now, the Jeremy Vine show today. It's actually very funny if you want to listen, really. And absolutely, that was the one that uh, Alan was weighing in on. He didn't want to talk about independence. He wanted to talk about the exactly. terrible travesty of that. So yeah. I was saying to him, <clears throat> it was just, you know, to be to be accurate here, it was the parliament that passed that. It was yeah. all the parties yeah. and it was also some conservative MSPs. Um, and at this point, he actually was suggesting that the SNP should come in and basically override the Scottish parliament and just nix the bill. Which I said to him, see, that's kind of weird, Alan. <laughs> you know? So I, I just think now, now we are where we are. OK, there might be, you know, some people will feel very strongly that they want to see that bill essentially squashed or lost or just whatever. But that that's currently being used by the opposition to bash everyone around the head. So I, I don't see much point in basically resurrecting that. It'll be whatever will happen will happen within the SNP and it will very much depend on who I think gets the, the, other the, the, the reason I raise the question is this. The Conservatives have signalled that they're going to lose any argument on the economy. They know they're going to lose any argument on the NHS. They know on the big issues they're going to lose, lose and lose. So what the Prime Minister has signalled is that he, he is going to create a culture war. In other mm. words, they're going to fight on culture. They're not going to fight on any of the issues that we've been talking about tonight. They're going to talk about culture, culture, culture. And I assume that's why Stan is behaving the way he's behaving just now, uh, in order to sort of, as it were, fortify. So then what, what do we do? You know, I was supposed to be on with, uh, uh, ooh, I can't pronounce her name properly, Hazarika, help. Mm, yeah. I can't remember her whole name. Anyway, so it was obviously going to be with Channel 4, which was pulled because Rishi Sunak is going to Belfast and there's a new nurse's strike. So finally, that's more important than Nicola. But what I thought, I thought, right, where they're going with this is, and this is the next thing, is that um, you guys, not only is Nicola gone so independence is buggered, but you guys and the SNP are basically stuffed because everyone's going to start getting kind of all hot and bothered about the Labour Party. Um, people who were Labour Party supporters will think, oh, actually, you know, one more push and used to, you know, yeah. Keir Starmer is such a nice guy and are going to swing back. And so I was thinking, right, I need to get all my arguments ready for that because that's going to be the next big one. And honestly, the rest of this stuff, I mean, the Tories are fucking toast. If you're going to spend your time worrying about their culture stuff, OK, you're just bigging up something that is not the bigger problem. 
the bigger problem is going to be the idea that labor is resurgent. It's one more push. <clears throat> That's the stuff we need to get our heads around. And in that respect, you know, there's lots and lots of things to say about that that are not culture war things. A I lot of labor, people labor are ready to be trapped because they're they, in the south of the border. They're yeah. only going to win if they get former conservative voters. The range yeah. of policy they can offer, therefore, is not hardly Labour. Now, Scottish Labour yeah. are going to be in the same boat because, according to John Curtis, the rise in Labour Party support in Scotland is almost exclusively from the Conservative Party. Yeah. So there's the problem for Labour. They, they, can, they can edge up a little bit, but only with Conservative voters, yeah. which totally yeah. limits what they can do as any kind of proper radical opposition. Many people in the independence movement and in the SNP have spent the last five, ten years talking about the Tories, the Tories, the Tories. And I'm constantly saying to people, it's Westminster, not the Tories. It's the system of government we've got. The, you know, if you if you argue against the Tories and sort of demonize the Tories, which they probably deserve every single bit of it. But if you do that, then it leaves the door open for people to think that Labour are the answer and Labour are not the answer for Scotland. Over the last uh, decade or so, well, actually, ever since uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, lost uh, his general election, we've seen uh, the, the sort of what used to be called the centre has moved so far to the right yeah. that all the parties, even if you're left of centre, you're really right nowadays and in England in, in particular. Um, and yet Scotland hasn't done that. Labour has nothing to offer Scotland. And if you really want, about 33% of them actually don't actually support independence. Yeah. And if they're going to have a massive landslide, I mean, every poll I've seen recently has suggested that the SNP with about 51, 52 M MPs will be the, the opposition party in Westminster, which is just crazy because the, the, the Conservatives all will lose so many seats. But if you really want to stop Labour making inroads in Scotland, then a de facto referendum where you ask Labour voters to lend their vote to the SNP for independence's sake, because you know it doesn't harm Labour because they're going to win elsewhere, probably stops Labour taking five or six of your SNP seats. And I think that's something that's got to be considered when people are thinking about the process. Yeah. But the thing is, yes, they're doing a culture wars. They're getting us talking about process. Exactly. Uh, we have to change the conversation to the type of Scotland we want to build, to the better country, to the fairer, greener, more successful economy that we can create if we just have the powers to do so. We have those conversations, independent support rises, and everything just gets easier for us. Hmm. That's a very good point. Leslie, we had some questions submitted earlier, and one was from uh, a gentleman. I'll spell his name because I, I, I hesitate to mispronounce because it's, it's always awful if you mispronounce people's names. Uh, S-V-E-R-R-E. And his, his surname, uh, our family name, is K-O-X-V-O-I-D. Does that ring a bell, that name? Uh, no, Sverre, no. but um, sounds like... Uh, his question... Uh, I know him. He's a real person. <laughs> he's a real person. Thank, thanks, Gordon. His question Wrong. is... This, <laughs> sorry? Can, can, his, can people not come on themselves here? No. Uh, well, no, because it, it's it's technically okay. it's, it's really difficult, uh, and also we can't moderate uh, uh, effectively if we did that. Uh, his question is this: Would it not have made sense to work closer alongside other inverted commas small close inverted commas and successful countries around the North Sea basin uh, to visit, to conference, to exchange ideas, and to get their political support? And he's he's included his telephone numbers in Norway and in Scotland. What's your answer to that? <laughs> well, I'm not sure who he thinks would be working more closely. Um, I've spent 12 <laughs> years running Nordic Horizons that has had 68 meetings in Scotland with 68 experts from all the Nordic countries brought over to speak, usually in the Scottish Parliament. Uh, that has been a Herculean amount of work. We've then had probably about six to eight online speakers um, since the COVID pandemic. So we've been basically banging away. Personally speaking, I've produced... I think it's five films before five films, um, three of which are about the Nordic nations and which together have had three quarters of a million views online. Um, I've also done a book uh, which has compared Norway and Scotland. So, you know, I've put a blooming shift on, on it now. Yeah. Um, where you see the rest of everybody going um, for a long time, I have to say the Scottish government <clears throat> were, were kind of 
I mean, Nicola went to um, an Arctic Circle event. The first one she went to was in 2016. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd been going for probably the six years before that. And by gum, she made an impression, I have to say. It was extraordinary. I mentioned it in a national column that I wrote, but it was like having a sort of, you know, Scottish political lady die there if you couldn't accept all those mixed metaphors because there was just a sort of star quality awe about people, mm. um, women that I knew really well as kind of very feisty, straightforward Nordic politicians were kind of like saying to me, do you think she'll speak to me? I said, for God, God's <laughs> sake, you know, he's like a normal human being, just go and speak to her. Um, so she, she, I think she was quite, uh, quite overwhelmed almost by the, the reaction she got there, hadn't expected that, and then started to go to the Arctic Circle events quite a lot and then started sending, you know, some of her, her, you know, the less charismatic. This is the problem because she she definitely was actually filling a 2000 seater stadium yeah. uh, in Iceland for these events. But um, so they made a bit of an effort. They had a Nordic policy statement. They had a Baltic policy statement. Nordic Horizons events did comprise a very large proportion of their Nordic policy statement. But they have beside behind the scenes, they've opened a, a kind of not exactly an embassy, but it is kind of in Copenhagen. Um, so they have been kind of trying to push the boat out, not, you know, as much as you would want to have happen. Um, but you've got to remember the other way around. The, the Nordic countries um, in the first Indy Ref were, were to many people quite disappointing. I think a lot of people, especially about Norway, expected the Norwegians would instantly see that we were the Norway to England, Sweden, and that uh, they should automatically see the common cause with us. And actually, because, you know, international relations are conducted as is a reserved issue, um, they, you know, they, they kept on having to deal with 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 Britain, with Westminster. So that was their default. And that will be what they're all like. Mm. We won't get any free passes from anybody until uh, until we kind of get out the other end on our own. So I don't know if that really answers what Svera was kind of asking. They could well, do think, more. Think sure, it's, it's been I, done I, in the background a bit. Yeah, I think maybe he was maybe asking more about government involvement, but yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think that's a very comprehensive answer. And uh, if he's not aware, he's aware now if he's uh, watching tonight. International relations is a reserve power. Yeah, well. Uh, so once yeah. we're independent, I, I certainly will do that. I mean, it's funny because I was just thinking, I like to think of myself as someone who knows quite a bit about the Nordic nations, but everything I know about the Nordic nations I've learned from Leslie. So I'll just let her answer that question. and we can... <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had one or two people on the show, and maybe maybe you could come on, Leslie, and talk to us more about that because people are interested. No question about that. Well, it would have been nice to say something a bit. You know, they could have just set up embassies. You know, just wait for yeah. somebody to come and then have an yeah. argument with them. You know, yeah. in, in all of the Nordic capitals. Yeah. Um, and there, you know, a lot of people felt that there was a kind of lack of verve in that. Yeah. But then there's lack of verve in pretty much everything the SNP do. I have to say. Yeah. So, um, uh, the, the, you know, this consistent. Yeah. I think people are looking for something a little bit different, and it's obviously coming from you, and it's coming from Gordon, where people, you're saying things like, "Well, let's get out there. The, the, you, know, you don't need anyone to hold your hand." The fact that the SNP are, are doing it or not doing it is incidental to some degree. You can do it yourself. Here's a question that's cropped up, which you might find interesting. Uh, Susan Sinclair is asking, as the roles of first minister and SNP leader have developed considerably into what are effectively two different functions, has the time come to recognize that, in fact, these are two specific jobs requiring different skill sets to ensure both roles are fulfilled satisfactorily? It's an interesting question. It's, it's something that I've been given some thought to. I mean, if you listen to what Nicola Sturgeon said, uh, she, she really kind of hinted that she felt the job uh, of being first minister and uh, running the independence campaign uh, is, is too much for one person. And if that's the case, then yes, it could be split. I quite like the idea, and I don't know how this would work, and I, I'm not a member of the SNP. I don't know their bylaws and regulations, etc. Yeah. But I do quite like the idea of uh, the Green Party having co-leaders, male and a female, etc. And, you know, I would imagine that helps um, uh, cut down the, the, the workload or give focus to the workload probably better. So you've also got a president of the SNP in, in Mike Russell, very capable guy who uh, clearly is going to lead the SNP's uh, referendum or de facto referendum uh, push as it is at the moment. Um, but yeah, I can see how 
there could even be theoretically uh, a party leader from Westminster and a first minister in uh, in Holyrood. That did happen once before for a short period of time before Alex Salmond got himself elected. So I wonder, you know, there probably isn't time because of the way it's happened, but I wonder if the SNP shouldn't have been having these conversations and considering does it have uh, outdated last century political party structure and should it be thinking about what sort of structure is appropriate for the future for this century? And I think it should have been having those conversations well before now. But the other thing about Nicola Sturgeon is that, that you know, she does, she's a very private person. I've, I've spent quite a bit of time with her uh, and I don't really know her. Um, you know, I think once in 20 occasions that I've been in her company, I felt that she, she, she sort of let her guard down a little bit. Um, and that's got to be exhausting. Um, you know, I think the next leader has to reach out and look for allies right across the political spectrum, across the yes movement, has to understand that allies need to be treated a bit better than the SNP has treated them in the past, uh, and needs to refocus the party on independence and say, okay, how do we go forward together? Because that's true leadership, yeah. you know, of the yes movement. And the SNP, no matter who you are, no matter how much campaigning you do, Nobody can get away from the fact that the leader of the SNP is the leader of the overall yes movement by virtue of the strength and power of that party and the fact that it is the only vehicle we've got that actually can deliver. Thanks. What do you think, Leslie, the idea of splitting the roles? Um, it is It is an interesting one. Um, and yes, I mean, just picking up from what Gordon said there, I mean, again, I wrote a national column about this yesterday and I totally agree with him, actually, that I remember Nicola from when when she stood in the 2003 SNP leadership battle and was actually losing. Um, and that was what prompted Alex Sam to come back out of retirement um, and stand on a joint slate with her, which everyone seems to have forgotten. Mm. Um, and it was that combination that won. And essentially, he gave her space to sort of grow as a politician, um, but she was going to lose. Uh, so it struck me then she was actually a very shy woman. Um, and like many shy people sort of adopt techniques to get through it all. When yeah. I watched her working her way through a room of with the selfies and everything, um, you know, it, it's a way, it's a very formal way to just have a quick interchange with someone and then move on. So you yeah. don't actually have to spend any real time talking to anyone. And to be honest, it must be very bruising to have to go through the hundreds and thousands of people she does go through anyway. But having said all of that, there's the temperamental thing. Then there's the kind of, then there's how that translates into politics. And there has been a shockingly concentrated form of power within the top of the SNP, which, um, you, you know, I don't know how it works really to go ahead with what's meant to be a new broom whilst you have Peter Morell staying as chief executive. Um, that always was, an un to me, an unhealthy kind yeah. of con yeah. concentration of power. Yeah, It, it shouldn't have yeah. been allowed to continue as long as it did, but yeah. now we've got essentially part of the old guard overseeing the election of the new. And uh, nobody's really raised this very much. Again, I suppose people don't want to kind of kick up too much shit, but I think that's completely unacceptable actually, and that Peter should go. Yeah, and I, I assume that his role is in the gift of the new leader. Is that the way, is that the way it works? Are you the, new the, gift, of the, the you gift of the new leader and the president. Right, the, he, the new leader would appoint both of them. It's my, well, no, it's no, 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 no. The, the president's elected. It's my understanding that the uh, the new. It's my understanding that the president and the leader of the party uh, have the authority to decide who's the chief executive. Yeah, um, and so, so I would, I would imagine. I mean, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I would imagine that if both, if you lose both your chief executive of the party and the first minister at exactly the same time, then that could be a little bit problematical. I would imagine that Peter is staying on to help organise the if the conference goes ahead and the, the election. Uh, and then we would probably, I would imagine that that would be it. I would imagine he'd move on after that. But I don't know. I don't have any inside information. Um, I don't know him at all. I haven't spoken to him in years. So I don't, I can't actually say, but I think that might make sense as a, as a solution. Um, right, or I or maybe or maybe the new leader will be someone who um, really loves him and wants him to stay on. Who knows? Yeah. Well, well yeah, well, see, there's it. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, if he's if he's kind of well, if he's hoping that there is somebody who's going to think he's the best thing since sliced bread, um, 
you know, it, it, some people have to be able to sort of say, hello, I think actually we really need a really big change here. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, we, it, we still do. It, it's, it's sort of hard to believe. I mean, if you think about any organisation and there's a new person at the top of it, I mean, the first thing they do generally is they sweep out the stable. I mean, it's with the good and the bad, it doesn't really matter too much because they want to create their own entity. It's, it's, it's the way organisations work. You, you know, you know, you've seen it a million times, Gordon, too. You, you know, you, you know, I've done it. Well, but, it's a bit Machiavellian, it's a bit yeah, old-fashioned, but it's not but, the progressive uh, type of yeah. uh, partnerships and relationships and yeah. engagement party that I'd like to see them become. But, uh, uh, but yeah, I understand where you're coming from on that. But I think um, uh, we need them to choose a new leader. And I think it's going to be very interesting when they do choose a new leader, if it's a fresh face in particular, um, and uh, that will allow them to be listened to by the media without all the negative filters of years and years of politics, etc. And I think that could be a real shot in the arm for the independence movement if they're saying the right things. Um, uh, but, you know, in terms of the internal management and issues of a political party I'm not a member of, it's really not my responsibility to, yeah. to, to, to sort of comment on that, to be honest with you. Yeah, but you take Leslie's point that it, it's... it's to... To, I'll put it as gently as I can, it's slightly unorthodox to have somebody reporting to the chief executive who's also married to the chief executive, to the party leader who's also married to the party leader. I mean, if you try to do that in a business setting... It's a really setting, unique situation, I think, yeah. The board would say, we're not having that. We're just not having it. And it wouldn't go anywhere. You know, So it's unusual that A, that it existed, and B, that it, it it was sustained over a long period of time. But anyway, and that's sure. not any reflection on the individuals involved. To None come back to Susan's point, I mean, that was really in response to her idea about splitting up the jobs of first minister and party leader. Yeah. And the thing is, we're talking about a party that has even more concentration of power than just that, because, you know, the first minister is the SNP leader and is married to the chief executive. Oh. And that little cabal with, you know, two or three other people has made an awful lot of decisions right in a very top down, you know, utterly <laughs> corporate party that um, has disappointed lots of its members that left uh, long before the kind of issues arose over gender uh, recognition. I mean, the whole common yeah. wheel bunch that left, you know, so we're, we're kind of forgetting the, the, the progress of disappointment. I, I can remember being, I can't remember which year it was. When, when Common Wheel came up with their um, ideas space across the Squinty Bridge yeah. from the SP conference. And uh, it was all the, co the kind of ideas that should have been being discussed in the SNP conference, where the Heathrow Lounge was the, you know, uh, kind of gr basically green room type thing. And the corporate sponsorship was really quite eye watering. Um, I mean, we, we understand that there was a, a missive put around MPs and MSPs. Um, that they were not to be seen at the idea space. They were not to cross the Squinty Bridge. Um, and in the end, approximately a third of all delegates did. So that probably did include a couple of them. But I mean, that was just, that was just sort of discomfort and dissent with the way things were being done then. And it didn't have any way to be raised properly apart from the uh, election of some characters like Chris Hanlon and, and the Commonweal Slate within the SNP that has all then got you know overlooked. It's taken a long time to get to a moment where a lot of these um, kind of collected hurts to how one might run something democratically have had any chance to be discussed. Yeah. So you know, there's just a wee moment here for an awful lot of things to kind of come to the surface. <coughs> and of course, if you're going to do a sort of business as usual, we just need continuity, you know, all that kind of thing, which yeah. sort of you know sounds like it makes sense. Then <laughs> off it all goes again. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you think perhaps uh, a question to both of you, maybe Gordon first? Uh, do you think there's a special role, stroke responsibility for Mike Russell in all of this? Well, I think Mike Russell has actually been a breath of fresh air from the SNP, reaching out across the S movement as much as he can. But his hands are also tied to a certain extent. Um, in terms of you know, I can't actually speak for everybody who runs a yes group, but of all the national yes groups, etc. And Leslie and I have been involved in a few of them across the years and, and met across several of them. And, and I don't think anyone has ever turned around to me and said, 
it's really good relation, good, good that we've got a great relationship with the SNP, that they're yeah. supportive of what we're doing and talking yeah. to us about it and interested in it. Um, you know, if, if anything, it seems like we're a mild annoyance, the fact that we're bothering to, to, to campaign and try and push the independence arguments, etc. you know, to, to a certain extent. That said, there are lots of really good people in the SNP that are great ministers. Uh, I have people I consider to be personal friends who are ministers and uh, spokespeople, etc., um, who are great and are you know, the sort of people that you want to be campaigning with, etc. Yeah. I hope, therefore, and that's what I've said before, that the new leadership has to say, okay, how do we actually look for allies out there? How do we all come together? How do we get rid of all of the, the bad feeling and just even converse on a different level? Uh, even say no. Say, sorry, I don't agree with what you're doing. That's great. But talk to people outside. And I'm pretty confident you'd, you'd, you'd find that pro-independence uh, journalists will also tell you that, that it's like getting blood out of a stone. Yeah. You know? And it is a political party. And political parties fight for their lives every few years. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you're devolved as well, then every couple of two, two years you fight for your lives. Yeah. And it brings a certain atmosphere. But actually, um, I think we need to think about... We were talking about how to build a better Scotland. How do you build a better political system? And I think the, the thing that the SNP have got to say is, well, how do we start yeah. that process okay. and evolve ourselves into a, a, a party that's fit for a new Scotland, but will also, also fit to deliver good, independence? Good, good point. Uh, we've got time for one last question, uh, and it's from Scotia. Uh, and the question is, in resigning, Sturgeon said that she could not, in inverted commas, reach across the divide close close quotes to an indie has the indie movement been too adversarial in its approach perhaps seeing labor as the enemy what do you think to that comment leslie uh well it's michael there um hello michael um i don't know about that you know because well i mean in many respects uh a unionist labor party i'm not going to say is the enemy but it sort of is a wee bit actually mm. um so the the kind of although the, obviously uh, in many ways there's there's a kind of common set of values and so on and in fact in another world Nicola Sturgeon would have been a great Labour Prime Minister yeah um, but we're not in another world <laughs> see, there's the rub so um, and you know there'll be a lot of people who will for example find it very hard to forgive the fact that Labour were the ones who pulled um, out of the Smith Commission so many powers that would have been really useful in the intervening 10 years. Uh, you know, the Gordon Brown obfuscation, the kind of, geez, the, the list of sharp practice actually by a lot of labor has been pretty gobsmacking. Um, mm. I don't know if, you know, I mean, okay, Nicola probably has been obviously quite, you know, quite, quite well, I was gonna say nippy, but that sort of fits into our stereotype, but she, she actually has in, in, I think of all the many times when um, you know she was in first minister's questions, and Richard Leonard was rambling on about you know in a long impassioned question about a reserved power, you know, and yeah. she would have to say, well, you know, Richard, if you want to join us in kind of asking for those powers to be devolved, you know, knock yourself out, mate. You know, I don't know how you how you deal with somebody who's so wide of the mark that they don't really have, they can't grasp a sort of distinctive position politically. I mean, I, don't, I think you're probably right. You don't need you know. I don't think you need to be sort of particularly vindictive to anybody, except Douglas Ross does kind of push you a bit. That's, personally speaking, never my style. So I don't know what it is Michael's feeling about the adversarial approach to Labour. I'm not really being able to conjure up much that makes me think of it. Yeah. Can you, can you think of anything that sounds adversarial? So the SNP and Labour are adversarial. Um, they have a parliamentary system, which was supposed to be better than it is, but because of the constitutional tribalism, you do still have Westminster type, you know, FMQs, etc. Um, and so, yeah, it is adversarial, but that's the difference between the Yes movement and the political parties. The Yes movement doesn't need to be adversarial with, with Labour supporters, but possibly with the Labour Party, because the Labour Party are putting Scotland down. Gordon Brown, in particular, uh, has done... And people sort of go, oh, is, 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 is independence anti-English? Well, actually, I'm pretty anti-Scots anti like Gordon Brown, who try to keep Scotland 
down whose beliefs about everything just being better as long as your betters in Westminster rule things for you. Yeah, I, I'm pretty adversarial against people like him. Uh, his latest uh, uh, musings on the Constitution were um, mind-numbingly stupid. Um, and so basically, yeah, uh, w with the party, yes, but not with the supporters. In fact, I think there's massive amounts of common ground that we can gain with Labour supporters because Labour supporters and SNP supporters, when every poll I've done on values, asking what their core values, what drives them, etc., the SNP and Labour supporters are the same people. It's mm -hmm. just that the SNP supporters are a bit younger and Labour supporters obviously a bit, a bit older, but they're the same people with the same mindsets. So I think that the... Uh, we need to reach out to Labour supporters uh, and actually talk to them about the fact that actually the type of politics that they want will very probably come to the fore in an independent Scotland. But you can't have it if you're going to have a right-wing Labour Party fighting the right-wing Conservative Party for right-wing voters that dominate London and the South East and the big population areas. Well, it's probably even more... Uh profound in that, in the sense that we interviewed David Calder on the show, who was an advisor to Robin Cook, uh, and his comment was, it's very difficult for Labour uh, to deal with the SNP because of the two main political parties in the UK, uh, in his estimation, uh, the Labour Party was the most unionist. He said, despite their Scottish roots, uh, right through the whole Labour Party, there's this very strong sense of unionism. And they just find it very, not in very Scotland. <laughs> only in the leadership in Scotland, not amongst its voters. Well, I, I take that point. Yeah, I take that point. But I uh, think so, it's, it's a tough one sorry, because also I went to a Labour Party conference, God love me, about four years ago because I'm a blooming journalist, you know. And there was a point where I thought maybe it's wrong that I've just stopped going to other people's conferences, you know, because okay, and really, I, w I wouldn't be going again. <laughs> I mean. That I had, oh, well, D Dirty Looks was the least of it. But um, I mean, doors sort of almost like swung right shut, you know, in my face, kind of, I could have actually smashed my face against the oh. door. Um, and I just thought that <clears throat> there's a there's a level of, of utter resentment here now about the fact that essentially, you know, the SNP or independence has stolen their voters. Yeah. And when that's where they sitting, see it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When you're sitting in the sessions, I I've got to say also, I've never come across, if people in, in the Yes movement are a bit worried sometimes about it being a sort of older set of people who are there, uh, just exactly what Gordon was saying, that it's an it's an old and quite ill bunch of people actually looking there. I just really felt for them in some respects, despite the fact that they obviously hated me so much that I needed to get out. <laughs> so it's a shame that things have come to that, uh, yeah. but that's yeah. where we are. Yeah. If I can if I can just sort of finish, I know we're running out of time here, but if I can just finish off by saying that we've been talking about Nicola Sturgeon going, and I guess you know, you probably haven't invited the Nicola Sturgeon fan club to comment on 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 this situation with, with with us too. But you know, I think it's worth saying um that Nicola Sturgeon did have some great talents. When you look at what she did uh during the COVID crisis, the briefing every day, it was pretty incredible. She dealt with it excellently. And every day I sat looking at that thinking, why is she doing this? She's going to just burn herself out completely. Um, and, you know, so, you know, in that respect, she was good. But as a leader of uh, a big part of the independence, grassroots independence campaign, uh, she didn't manage to move us as far forward as I would have liked to, to have seen. So all I can say is she's gone. She had many great talents, but that does not damage the independence movement because someone else will step up and hopefully we'll have the right partnership with the party going forward and the grassroots. And I don't think it's really going to slow down independence because I think we can get a new focus on independence with the new leadership of the SNP. And I'm as convinced as ever that we're going to find a way to make it happen in the next few years. Thanks, Gordon. Any last remarks, Leslie? Well, just to answer Ruth Watson's question that's been asked there, who do Leslie and Gordon think would make a good leader? I mean, honestly, God knows. But, I mean, I would love to have seen Stephen Flynn and Mary Black as a kind yeah. of co-leaders. Interesting. Well, let, let, let's see. I'm not going to say who, who I think would make a good leader, but I am going to say that I'm pretty convinced that it's a two-horse race between uh, Angus Robertson and Kate Forbes if they both decide to go for it. Oh, and they don't think that Joanna Cherry is a dark horse. Yeah. Who I but, don't think will stand. But I, no. my, my thing is more, 
I think there's got to be a generational change. Yeah. And that's what I, a great relief was, actually, you know, with no offence to Ian Blackford, just the levels of vitality that just suddenly yeah. became evident when you had those two in. And they're also a very good tag team. They work very well together. It's gender balanced. They're young. Um, you know, they got a bit of they're, they're they're so relaxed when they're speaking. They're tremendous communicators in a different way. I would love to have seen yeah. them in. But, you know, the rules preclude that happening. So there you are. New generation for a new Scotland. Sounds great. That's the, that's the very best way to end the programme. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Gordon. And thanks, Leslie. Thanks very much indeed. And thanks particularly for coming on the show at very, very short notice. It's much Pleasure. appreciated. And uh, thank you very much. I'm just going to make a few concluding remarks. If you could stick around, that would be great. Um, well, there we are, folks. That's the uh, end of the show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We set out to answer your questions about the uh, prospects and the route for the independence movement from now on. I think you've had some very eloquent and erudite responses to that question. Thanks to both Leslie and Gordon. And thanks to all of you out there for joining us tonight. I hope you've enjoyed the show. As always, you can come here for the big hitters, as you can see tonight. Look out next week for Professor Leslie Stark of Edinburgh University. She'll be here on Wednesday. And a little plug for my column in the Sunday National. You'll find it in the seven-day supplement. I'll be taking a closer look at the BBC and asking whether it serves the nation's interests. To all of you, thanks for joining us. Stay safe, take care, and don't forget the crowdfunder. Please, please, the crowdfunder. Thank you. Good night, all.